So I wanted to show you what I did to this hammer, um, compare it to the one that's been unmodified before I go ahead and finish this one up. They've both been bent. Um, first, that was the first thing I did was uh, heat this section up and bend these and get them in position where they're uh, hitting the firing pins uh, on center. So from here though, um, this one's been modified to give it a cleaner, more graceful look, give it a little sleeker design and a little longer looking neck. And uh, this one's unmodified. I'm going to show you what I did different. Um, if you can see, try and get these lined up pretty close for you. You can see that I thinned the neck down a little on both sides. I contoured the radius here a little better. And I changed the radius on the back of this quite a bit. And then I also changed how thick the thumb spur is and flattened it out more on top so that it's not quite so big and fat and bulky. And then this way I also gave it a lot narrower waist and thinned down the transition here on both sides and gave it a more rounded and cleaner look than that one. And then on the face of it I took out the shadow line all the way around and the transition here as you can see on this one there's no more shadow line on this and so it gives it a it, it's not very much of a change um, you know the, the difference in thicknesses and whatnot is kind of subtle but if you look at them you can really see that just those little bit of changes gives it a much longer more graceful curve and radius and uh, changing the thumb spur really cleans up the look of that just thinning it down and and giving it a nice thin waist really gives it a nice clean look that way so they're not not really huge changes or modifications but it sure changes the appearance quite a bit so I'll get on with this one and get it done and uh, then I'll be ready to move on and do some other stuff so I was asked if I could do a kind of a walk around on this because uh, guys didn't want to see the overall picture um, hadn't really showed them that and I uh, wanted to see it from some different angles so I figured I would do that before I tore it all down and got it ready for engraving and then the heat treat and case hardening Hopefully that pretty much covers the whole view. See what's going on here. So I'm down to doing some engraving here and uh, what I've done is I've used some engraving white to lay this out on and uh, put my maker's mark on here and you might not be able to see it very good but it's uh, just a transfer pretty uh, light um, kind of got to have the light just in the right reflection so that you can see it really good the equipment that I use for engraving is a uh, Lindsay um, classic with foot control 
think this happens to be one of the best machines on the market for power engraving, air engraving. And uh, the templates that he sells um, for sharpening are probably one of the best things ever invented. Um, makes life so much easier for uh, you know getting everything to the right angle and getting it to the same same position, same cut, same angle every single time. So good equipment. I really like it. Um, not much to say about this. Uh, if you want engraving lessons or want to learn how to do that stuff, there's plenty of guys in this world that are a lot better at it than I am. Uh, obviously, I'm not a full-time engraver. I'm primarily a gun maker. So lots of lots of master engravers out there though who can do a much better job than me. Um, this gun here, being field grade, doesn't get a lot of engraving on it, so uh, what I'm doing is uh, I'm engraving the action uh, before I do the heat treat and whatnot because uh, it's almost impossible to cut color case hardening. Um, you know, it's just a lot easier to do this kind of work when the metal's still soft before everything's hardened and treated. Um, hard metals can be cut, but uh, there's just simpler to do it when it's before it's heated up and treated. So. Um, this will get uh, my maker's mark, it will get um, the double deuce on the other side, and then it's going to get a serial number and um, just a few little minor things. It's not going to get anything else, there's not going to be any uh, scroll work or, or acanthus or anything like that on here. This is just a basic, basic uh, field grade gun, so the engraving is just standard markings basically. So I got all the engraving done and uh, got the first batch packed into the crucible with the charcoal and put in the furnace. So I wanted to stop here since I've got a few hours before I can do anything else with it and uh, give you a little treatise on, on uh, color case hardening and, and uh, heat treating, tampering, that kind of thing. The metal for this action is 8620, which is a very good metal for color case hardening um, and it'll through harden and uh, so that helps a lot too uh, with this kind of work. Um, one of the things I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give you my exact specific instructions on how I color case harden. And the reason I'm not going to do that is because it probably wouldn't help you very much if you wanted to try it yourself. Um, the science behind color case hardening is fairly easy to understand. You're just bringing metal up to its, um, you know, osteotetic point where carbon migration will go from the bone and wood charcoal into the metal. Um, that's the science of it, and it gives it a hard outer casing once it's quenched by rapidly cooling. But the fact is, is the science of it doesn't give you good colors in color case hardening. The science of it gives you a hard surface. In order to get good colors, it takes a bit of um, experimentation, and so, you know, you have pretty much an infinite combination of variables that can be adjusted. and produce different colors, different variations, and give you everything from just a hard gray finish to, you know, a beautiful, brilliant color case hardening. And so the combination of, of ingredients and whatnot that I use isn't likely to work for anyone else because nobody else has access to my well water, and I quench in my own well water. Um, and that's just one of the variables is the, the type of quench you do. So I have a homemade furnace that's basically big enough to do everything up to a two bore in and still have room for the crucible without rubbing the sides or, or back or front anywhere. Um, and the crucible is just a steel um, rectangular tube. It's a quarter inch thick wall. It's capped on one end, welded sealed. And the other end has a lid that fits over it. Fairly snug and tight, but loose enough that uh, through expansion and contraction you can still pop it off when you're ready to quench. Um, the materials I use, the uh, bone charcoal and the wood charcoal that I use, are uh, bought from Brownells, um, and it's their just their standard bone and wood charcoal for color case hardening. Uh, since I don't do a lot of this, you know, I only do one or two batches a year. Buying from Brownells in, in five gallon buckets works fine for me. Uh, if the guy was going to dedicate his time to color case hardening, um, he'd want to buy um, in bulk from from a major supplier or a resource. What I do with the bone and wood charcoal is I mix them 50/50 by volume. A can of one to a can of the other, basically, and I just use a, like an old um, canned goods can. And so I mix them 50-50, uh, you know, one-to-one -one ratio, basically. 
and uh, I make sure they're mixed really well so that they're kind of evenly distributed of the, the bone and the wood charcoal. And then uh, when it comes to the parts, obviously they need to be polished. Um, if you don't polish them at least to 320, you won't get very good colors. Uh, in order to get really good, bright, vibrant colors, you've got to have a good prep and polish on your metal. That's just all there is to it. Um, once it's polished, um, then you need a very, very clean metal. Uh, so you use, I use, you can use about anything you want that'll strip oils off the metal, uh, you must, particularly your finger oils and whatnot, but uh, I use just a brake drum cleaner and acetone. Um, spray it down really good, let it drip dry, and then rub it down with acetone to clean off any uh, residue from the brake drum cleaner. So that's how I clean the metal up. Um, when it comes to small parts, the hammers, the little pieces, the lock plates, things like that, I tend to wire them together. Um, the reason I do that isn't for anything in particular that changes the color case hardening. It just makes them easier to fish out of the bottom of the quench tank when they're uh, dropped in the water. And then uh, the wire is so brittle at that point it just pops right off anyway. So that's one thing I do that uh, some guys do or don't. You know, some guys want their parts to free fall. Um, other guys, you know, if you've got issues with warping, which you can have on thinner parts like the lock plates and stuff, um, I haven't had a lot of problem with that. but. Uh, you can uh, block them or jig them to another piece of metal to keep them fairly rigid. Uh, that helps. The other thing that helps is you can use shielding to uh, keep the water from, from hitting it hard at the surface and allowing the water to kind of uh, collapse in around it. So there's other ways to deal with warping and stuff like that. But uh, the basic process is you uh, pack it in a crucible with bone and wood charcoal. You stick it in the uh, heat treat furnace and you bring it up to a basically a a migratory temperature, a temperature where the carbon is going to migrate over, and uh, the best way to know how to do that, and you know, there's lots of different metals out there. Some are much better for color case hardening than others. 8620 happens to be one of the better ones. Uh, 1018 will color case up beautifully, but it won't through harden. Uh, 8620 will through harden, but the, the best way to know exactly what temperature to take any given metal up to is uh, a book like this. Um, this is a machinery uh, handbook. It's 22nd edition, so it's a little older. But uh, there's a section in here that's got about 60 or 70 pages of nothing but heat treating and uh, tampering and color case hardening. And it gives you a full set of tables on uh, what temperatures to take your metal up to um, for color case hardening or for heat treating. And so you can look it up and know exactly what temperature you're supposed to be at. Uh, given you the metal you're trying to color case. Uh, there are some metals that don't color case well at all. Um, you need pretty much you need a low carbon uh, steel to get a good color case. Uh, anything with high carbon in it, you can get some colors out of it and, and even produce some good colors, but it takes a considerable amount of work because the carbon migration is, is very limited for high carbon steels. So those are some things to consider. Some of the other variables involved in uh, this um, is the ratio, like I said, I mix my bone to wood at a one-to-one -one ratio. But uh, other guys, you know, you ask, if you ask a dozen different guys who do color case hardening what their formula is, you'll get a dozen different answers because everybody's situation is a little different. Uh, some guys go three to one, some guys go two and a half to one, some guys go one to one like I do. You know, there's a lot of different combinations there that you can play with and adjust to get different colors. Um, some other variables that are involved is uh, the quench. Uh, in the quench tank, you uh, some guys are you know using distilled water. I use my own well water because my well water happens to be a good pH and, and gives me a good result at the end. Um, but if you're on city water where you've got fluoride and chlorine and stuff in your water, it's pretty much useless for color case hardening. Uh, for some reason, the chemical imbalance and the pH imbalance just washes the colors down to basically nothing. Uh, so a lot of guys are you know using uh, well water or city water or using city water or have bad well water. They'll use um, bottled or distilled water to uh, do their quenches. Uh, there's aeration. When you when you're doing a quench, you can aerate the water. Some guys do it, some guys don't. Some guys aerate the water for an hour or two and then shut their air hose off and then quench. The theory behind that is is that. The uh, air bubbles coming up through the water as the metal's falling through the quench will get you will give you scaling as the air pockets hit the metal. I've never had that problem. Um, the way I do it is uh, once I'm ready to quench, I'll have my aerator running for an hour or so before I before I'm ready to pull my metal and quench it, and uh, I'll leave the aerator running the whole time. I've never had scaling issues dropping it into aerated water. Some guys, you know, say that they do have problems with that, and so they'll you know they'll aerate and uh, 
then turn their air off and quench in, in just aerated water. Other guys don't use aeration at all. They quench in just plain water. So there's tons and tons of variables involved in this. And so that's like I said, if I gave you my you know, exact formula, how it's done, how long a piece of metal's held at temperature, and, and exactly how it's dropped in the water and everything, it would probably give you a starting point and give you a basis to, to kind of work it out, work out your own formulas. But the fact is, is it's not going to give you an exact match of the colors that I get because, like I said, you don't have access to my well water and without knowing the pH and, and having an exact composition of, of similar water, it won't give you the same results. So that's kind of my short treatise on, on heat treating. It's, uh, it's really not a hard process, but there is kind of a steep learning curve in it because you have to work out all the variables for your individual situation. Well, the color case hardening is done. Um, I've got them oiled up pretty heavy right now. And I brought them outside because I wanted to be able to show you the colors, and it usually shows up in natural light better than anything else. But, uh, overall, it's got good coverage. Not too many spots washed out really bad, and there's a little gray you know, in, in a few spots. But uh, overall, the coverage is pretty good, and the colors are pretty nice. Um, they're not super bright, but uh, they're not dull either. They've got some really nice tones to them got some nice browns and purples in there as well so overall I think it turned out to be a pretty good color case pretty happy with it they won't be quite this shiny when they're done and in the gun like I said right now I've just got them really covered in oil to kind of protect them keep them from you know my fingerprints and whatnot from you know, oil staining them from my uh, finger oils but uh, Overall, they turned out really nice. Got some nice colors in them. Ought to look pretty good on the gun. So what I've been working on the rest of the week here is a reloading tool. And uh, basically, this isn't going to be a resizing die or anything like that. This is basically a field reloading tool. And uh, I did this when I built the single shot too. I made a simple reloading tool for these. This brass that uh, is made by S&H is super, super heavy stuff. The wall thickness is really heavy on it, and when you get down towards the base and whatnot, it's really thick. And the web in here is about three eighths of an inch. So I mean, this is a monstrous brass. And really, if you if a guy wanted to like full length resize this, you'd need a probably a 20 ton hydraulic press to do it. Uh, there's no way you're going to do it in like a, a rock truck or a reloading bench kind of tool. It's it's going to have to be done with a press. So the simple fact is is since both chambers were cut with the same reamer, they're both identical chambers. Once this brass is fired once through either chamber, the reloading won't make any difference for resizing it. Um, for one thing, black powder isn't going to stretch this brass enough to mess with it. Even in a lifetime of use, I don't think you'd get enough of, of a stretch on this to have to worry about resizing it at all. Um, from what my customer with the single shot tells me is he's had no problems whatsoever with just reloading as is. And so the the reloading tool is cut with the chamber reamer. It's a chamber size uh, fit. And the way this is going to work is uh, I've got a couple more pieces to make for this yet. But uh, you drop your brass in, there will be a decapping end on this. It will be for um, depriming and repriming. You set that on there and then you'll turn it upside down and you'll run your punch down in and, and pop the primer out of it. And then you can flip it back over put a new primer in and seat your primer and that'll all be with one single cap that'll go on this end and then um, two different tools one for decapping and one for repriming on the other end I've got to shorten this up quite a bit and it'll get cut off at uh, um, just above just below the length of the cartridge and uh, it'll be shouldered just like the other end it'll have a tool that sits on top of it so you put your powder in your um, wad if you need to make up any difference you know um, on the single shot the loads were about 350 grains so it left a lot of empty cartridge so uh, the space was filled up with uh, uh, wool felt works real good for black powder loads to use a wool felt wad in between takes up all the space real nice you don't have any problems with it and then what you do is you'll put the other end on this and like I said this will get cut off down here and it'll look basically like the other end put the other end tool on it and it'll have a, an edge that rolls up into it. And uh, so you set the powder in, wad in, put your ball in, and get it below the halfway line on your radius. 
so that it's behind the rim and then you set the tool on there and give it a good whack with a uh, rubber mallet and what it'll do is crimp the edge in and uh, seat the, the ball basically so that it's, it can't come back out of there. On the single shot I made the reloading tool so that it just barely crimped the edge. On this one I'm going to go a little more aggressively. I want it to really make a hard seat on the edge and uh, the reason for that is is in a double rifle the recoil especially on something this big and the fact that, that other ball is going to weigh a half pound the recoil forces could dislodge the ball and that would be almost catastrophic um, you know it'd be like having a if it, if it dislodged it far enough into the throat it would have be like having a, an obstruction in the barrel when you try to shoot the other side so I'm going to make this tool set up to where it really hard crimps around the ball and keeps the ball from dislodging under recoil so that's the way this one will be made and I'll show you the rest of the parts and how it works when I get them all built and done. So, but that's what I've been working on for the rest of the week here is uh, getting a set of reloading tools built for this thing. So this is as far as I got. Um, obviously I showed you that just a minute ago. This piece here is the uh, part that sits on here. It's for uh, depriming this way and then for uh, repriming this way. And then I also got the uh, crimp ring made. And there will be an outside ring that seats over this. And uh, then obviously the two punches still need to be made yet. So that's as far as I got this week. I'll get those other couple parts made uh, first part of next week. And uh, probably do some casting and get some uh, balls cast up for this. And then I got a couple little odds and ends of things I got to do to the barrels before I can go out and shoot this. So. That'll all be in next week's, and uh, I'll get on with it from there.